Hello, AP Calculus AB students. Mr. Record here from Avon, and welcome to the third and final edition of our example one uh, that all focuses around 5.4, introducing this idea of the first derivative test. It's all about really finding the locations of a relative or local maximum or relative or local minimum. So if you remember, we introduced this idea in the first video in the series that covered part A's example, and we discussed very carefully how this derivative test is a wonderful tool by which you can determine where a function has a high point or a low point. And then we focused on a couple of different examples in the previous two videos, each one a little bit different. One of them had a trig function in part A. Part B was this kind of unusual function with this two-thirds exponent. And then we're going to finish up, like I said here, with our part C, which is a rational function, x squared, or x to the fourth plus one over x squared. So we're going to first start by taking the derivative, and I'm going to let you take the derivative any way that you want, but I like to take my derivatives the easiest way possible. And what I mean by that is let's go ahead and simplify this thing. It's amazing what effect a little bit of algebra can have to make your calculus go down a little bit easier. Right? In fact, there was a song that says a spoonful of algebra makes the calculus go down. Something like that. I don't know. So if we do this division, we get x squared plus, and then we could just call uh, 1 over x squared x to the negative 2. And look at how much simpler taking the first derivative is. You know, these are rules that are not new. I think you've had your teachers always telling you, try to take the derivative the easiest way possible. We want to do that. Make your life easy. So we have our derivative. Now we probably want to write this where it's a little bit more friendlier on the eyes. And I always tell my students, let's get a common denominator. Let's write this with one single fraction, and that's going to make it a little easier to analyze. So that denominator clearly would be x to the third power here. And then at that point, I need to multiply the 2x by x to the third over x to the third. So I now have a 2x to the fourth, and then minus my 2 there. I think we're good to go. I think we are ready to show when does this derivative equal 0, and when does this derivative be undefined. And we have two different issues. That's going to give us two different results. Let's work through the top part first. I might work this one out because it may not be super obvious, but if we were to factor out a 2, which would leave us with this, we can then essentially cancel that 2 away, divide them to both sides, and he's gone. And then you see that x to the fourth minus 1, you could factor that. It is the difference of two perfect squares at which point I hope that you can see that this factor is going to yield plus or minus 1. Now this one is going to yield nothing. Nothing, at least in the real number system. It would yield plus or minus i, but you know there is no i in calculus, right? Spell it, C-A-L-C-U. So there is no i in calculus. Therefore, we're not going to worry about these imaginary numbers. So plus or minus 1 is the only critical value that we have for the derivative equaling 0. And as far as for the uh, derivative being undefined, obviously this denominator set equal to 0 is 0. Now, Let's talk. It's easy to overlook that this 0 has a little bit of issue. There's some issues with 0, you guys. You can't let this function take on an x value of 0. It's OK if you don't notice that and you put together your number line. You're going to see it eventually. I guarantee that this 0 is not going to be a position for a relative extrema, because I think it's a position where there's a vertical asymptote, and that's perfectly OK. Now, that position could be a, a place where behavior changes. Graph could change from increasing, decreasing, or otherwise. But let's go ahead, and we're going to leave it in there and, and kind of see how that manifests itself here in a bit. So I like to make my long number line here. Some of you might like to draw a table, a chart. Uh, that's perfectly fine. Number lines aren't required. In fact, a number line or a table, 
won't be scored typically on the AP Calc exam. It's just a tool for you to use to organize your information so that you can express the answer in a nice, hopefully concise, verbal form. We're going to look at that in a second. So what do we have here? Well, we got the sine of f prime. That almost rhymes. And then we have behavior of f. That's a way that we can describe our findings here. And as far as our sine uh, test, I'm going to choose something to the left of negative 1. Negative 2 seems like it would work splendidly for me. Where am I going to take that negative 2? Good question. Let's go to the prettiest form of our first derivative, which is right here. You can use really any form that you want. That kind of appeals to me. And I'm going to go ahead and plug negative 2 in. Negative 2 to the 4th, wow, that's a big number. 16. 16 times 2, well, okay, that's 32 minus 2 over negative 2 cubed is negative 8. I can see that that's going to be a negative result. It's actually 30 divided by negative 8. So we know that we are decreasing. Our function f is decreasing. Let's pick something between negative 1 and 0. Yep, sorry about that. Negative half seems to be about as good as anything. If you take the negative half and raise it to the fourth, you get 1 16th. So I know that that's a little tricky, 2 times 1 16th. But think about it. If you subtract 2 from that, all that you need to know is that is negative. The numerator is negative. The denominator? is also negative because you're taking a negative value to the third power, oh, odd power. A negative over a negative is a positive. So we have increasing behavior here. Notice, you don't really have to simplify this. You just have to get it into a state that you are confident of its behavior. Let's test something between 0 and 1. Yeah, it's going to be positive 1 half, so it's not much better here. But the numerator is going to be a familiar looking friend. 2 times 1 16th minus 2. And the denominator is now going to be positive half to the third. Now the difference here is that we have a negative result on top over a positive result on the bottom. Negative over a positive is deed negative, so we're going to decrease there. And then to wrap things up here, we'll test, say, positive 2. You're going to see some familiar looking results that we had from testing negative 2, perhaps. You're going to get a positive result on the top. And then 2 cubed is definitely positive. So you're positive all the way around, which means your function was increasing. And now the big reveal. What are our relative extrema? Well. Let's see, do we have relative min in this problem, which we can just abbreviate like that. You can also call it local. Relative and local are very interchangeable words. The AP exam tries to use them both very equally so that students uh, don't get an advantage if they've used a textbook that um, mentions as only one. Um, I like to mention them both so that you're very familiar. So decrease to increase, decrease to increase. That's happening twice. Seems like they see they seem to be happening at negative one, comma something, and at positive one, comma something. I'm going to go ahead and find the y values like I have been doing for most of the other problems. Plugging in negative one and raising it to the fourth and adding one is going to be a two. Negative one squared is a one. So it looks like positive two is going to be that y coordinate. And if we plug one in for the original we're going to get positive 2 there as well. Don't forget, if you are going to find the y values, plug those x's into the original. I'd like you to give me an answer, a reason, why are these relative min? And that is because f prime of x, that's our derivative, changes signs. How? How did it change signs? Don't just say it changes signs. It changes signs from a negative to a positive. And where is it changing those signs? Well, you could say at x equal negative 1 and x equal positive 1. And that really does a good job of wrapping up the justification that one would have to provide for this min, uh, these two mins. Relative max, it looks like there's one. There's only one instance here where the graph has an uh, increase to decreasing type of behavior. And that would occur at the x value of 0. but I wanted to stop there because, wait a minute, if I keep going, 
what the heck do I put there? Because there is nothing to put, right? If you plugged zero into this equation, you end up with something that's nonsense. You, you can't have a relative min or a max if you can't have a value, if you, if you don't have a point. And so there is no relative max in this problem. And sometimes I allow my students to earn credit by omission in this case. If you don't state there's a relative max, then I assume that you know that there isn't one. Um, it is nice if you go ahead and proclaim that. It's a little bit more clear. So you want to make sure you do that. And, and you guys, that's really a great reasoning why it's never good to say, oh, you have a relative max anytime a graph changes from increasing to decreasing. Graphs can change from increasing to decreasing all the time, but yet do so around an asymptote. And I think you're about to find this out when we go to the next page. Let's take a look at the graph of x to the fourth plus 1 over x squared. Here he is. Notice the minimums do occur exactly where we had predicted them, or not so much predicted, but analyzed them. And then over here, we've got a situation where, oh, the graph is increasing and then changes to decreasing, but it's doing so at this vertical asymptote, which can't serve as a relative min or a max. You're going to be doing a lot of these kinds of things really over the next several sections to round out your unit five in your AP calculus class. And one of the things that students kind of struggle with in calculus is the fact that you are analyzing things. You don't analyze things very much when you take algebra one not a little bit more in geometry in a different way, much more visually, but you don't really analyze things very much in Algebra 2 or even pre-calc to an extent. And that's what makes calculus fairly challenging. There's this, there's this uh, hierarchy of learning um, achievements called Bloom's Taxonomy that starts with basic knowledge and then moves to comprehension and then application and then analysis is even higher on that list. And that's why calculus can be hard. So you've got to stick with it. Don't give up because you will get better if you practice. I promise. I've seen it many, many times with the students that I've worked with over the last 30 more or more years. Anyway, we thank you for joining us and we'll see you at the next video.